Does this have something to do with this parallel system of empathy that people talk about? Bingo. You just got it. So we're so the Mohr molecule is the empathy molecule. And that's why you know, I teased you with this, this little test tube, right, which I brought along. Right. So it all comes back to blood. So um, we're going to find morality in your blood. Uh, I really want to focus on why we would ever trust a stranger. And it's something that we do quite readily, and we don't have a good sense of why we do it. I'm going to explain very clearly how we measure trust in the lab and how we've been able to characterize the chemical basis for trust. So that's going to be one of the main themes I'll talk about. Well, we've been talking with Paul Zak, and I certainly look forward to your presentation coming up. Thanks, Thanks very time. much. Great. Okay. When humans, it's known to be released by the brain when women give birth or breastfeed. It's released during sex by both sexes. And that's all we knew about it until six years ago. But in animals, oxytocin was associated with bonding to mates, for animals that live together, and what we might call cooperative behaviors. So they had this idea, well, maybe oxytocin would facilitate trust between human beings. Right, so a note of caution, this is not OxyContin, the prescription painkiller, different animal. Okay. So I had this idea about 10 years ago. I did what you guys did. I tried it out on some colleagues. And one of my colleagues said, that is the world's stupidest idea. <laughs> said, this is just a female hormone. Why would anything important be associated with females? <laughs> wow! I said, yeah, but men make this too. There must be a reason that men make it. Okay, so this may have been a stupid idea, but it was a testably stupid idea. In other words, I thought I could design an experiment to test whether oxytocin made us trust strangers. Right? So this began my odyssey studying oxytocin. And here's what I learned. Your body has no store of oxytocin. It's directly synthesized by the brain, only when you need it. More than that, it has a very short half-life, three minutes. So when it's released, it's a quick on and quick off. And lastly, it degrades rapidly room temperature. So now I have a very tough experiment. I have to have some stimulus that releases oxytocin, capture it fast, and keep it cold. I think I can do that. And I don't want to use the classical ways to release it, giving birth, breastfeeding, or sex, all those are too messy to run in my lab. I need some other thing. And what I want to do is I want to measure trust at the same time. The trust part was easier. It turns out the experimental economists had developed a task that measured trust in a laboratory. I said, well, I think I could use that task. So here's how it works. You recruit a bunch of volunteers for an experiment, give them all $10 for agreeing to sit in these hard chairs for an hour and a half, and then give them lots of instruction in this task. And here's the task. We'll match you up randomly in pairs. Within each pair, there's a first decision maker and a second decision maker. And the first decision maker, after lots of instruction, and by the way, no deception, we're the trust guys. We don't want to deceive people. That would just be bad karma. Right? So we're really paying you for this. And here's the task. You're the first decision maker. You can give up some of your $10 and ship it to someone across the lab. But you don't know who that person is. You can't see him or her. You can't talk to them. And you'll do it one time. So whatever you give up from your account will get tripled in the other person's account. Right? So if you give up eight of your ten dollars, you'll keep two, but that person gets twenty-four. So get a little computer prompt saying, hey, this person sent you twenty-four dollars. You have thirty-four bucks in your account. Do you want to send some of them back to the first person? So the consensus view in experimental economics is that transfer from person one to person two is a measure of trust. And it's clever because it's non-gratuitous. Like, like you, I'm very skeptical of people telling me, Oh, I'm a very trustworthy person. And when I was 18, I gave money to the homeless. And so this is really the genesis of what I call the Jerry Maguire approach to research. Right? So if you really are a trusting person, show me the money. Right? Put the money on the table and see where that goes. And I can get an objective measure of trust. In addition, I can get a measure of trustworthiness, the reciprocation of trust. Right? So if someone trusts you, do you give money back to them? Now, again, this is all anonymous. We do it by computer because we have to get away from what I call the cute guy or girl problem. Imagine if the person across from you is a cute guy or girl. Of course you behave differently. Come on. Everyone knows that. To do it by computer, it's really real. You really match with someone else in the lab. Oh, I have another problem. I have to measure oxytocin in blood. So think about this task. You have $10. You're going to have some mad scientist stick your arm with a needle and take four tubes of blood. And you're asking me to give that up to someone else I can't see? Yeah, so people take this very seriously. 
So this is the origin of what I call vampire economics. Right? You're going to make an economic decision, and the vampire is going to come and take some blood. And we're going to take it fast and keep it cold. Okay, so what do we find? We found that just like in these animal models in which when one animal approaches in a calm, in a cooperative way, the brain releases oxytocin, the more money individuals received denoting trust, the more their brains released oxytocin, and the more oxytocin they had on board, the more they reciprocated. This is huge. Right? First of all, we just found the first non-reproductive stimulus to reduce oxytocin release. And second, we showed why we trust people. We trust them because we think they're going to be trustworthy. Right? Why else would you trust somebody? It's not altruism. You're trying to say, look, I trust you because I think something's going to happen. Okay, you're going to reciprocate. What's wrong with this experiment? Remember that faint signature of oxytocin? Maybe I'm just a sloppy scientist. I blew it. I didn't keep it cold enough. Or there's some other factor involved in there. So we did measure nine other hormones that interact with oxytocin. We didn't find that they affected trusting behaviors or oxytocin release. But still this kind of this nagging thought. They didn't really get this direct connection. Right? I had to use this stimulus to induce oxytocin release. So I thought, if I could just go into people's brains and tickle the oxytocin-producing neurons, turn on the oxytocin system and see what happens, that'd be awesome. So my next experiment, I got this really big drill, and I started drilling to people's... No. What I did instead was I developed a nasal inhaler that will pack the sinuses with oxytocin. After about an hour, this will pass into the brain. And I'll show you what that looks like. Let's see if that will run. Okay, so this is uh, this oxytocin inhaler, which I developed using one of the classical methods of science. That method is called auto-experimentation. Right? I practiced on myself. I did everything short of a drill to get this stuff into my brain and making sure it didn't kill me. Okay, so turns out now I've put over a thousand people on this inhaler, no adverse effects. Um, so we do 40 small sprays up the nose, you take a deep breath after five of those sprays, and you slowly put this in the sinuses and wait an hour. And then we re-ran this trust experiment. What we found is that not only could we induce people to trust a stranger with real money, we more than doubled the number of people compared to placebo who sent all their money to a stranger. So when oxytocin is high, we trust others in a tangible way. Now, what's the critique of that? Well, sure, you put them on a drug. This is a prescription drug. But we had them do objective risk-taking tasks. We had them, we measured their mood and their cognition. They're cognitively intact. We've just changed the balance between appropriate levels of trust and distrust. So in animals, oxytocin mediates approach and withdrawal. In humans, it does the same thing, but also modulates at a distance trust and distrust. Right? We need to maintain that balance all the time. And we do it on a second-by-second -second basis. Okay. So at this point, you need to get worried. Right now, we have to worry about some unscrupulous politician or salesperson who's going to spritz this in the air. All of a sudden, you're casting your vote or opening your wallet. Okay, so this isn't much of a worry because we use two teaspoons of liquid up your nose to get an effect. It's a lot of liquid. You know you're getting it. It's not that pleasant. Okay, so a little spritz in the air is not going to do it. A little dab on the neck is not going to do it. You won't get enough into the bloodstream to get into your brain. Okay. But this system is being manipulated all the time in much more subtle ways. So let me cast you back to 1980, to a naive young high school student working at an Arco gas station in the outskirts of Santa Barbara, California. It's a lovely Sunday afternoon. In walks a man excitedly showing me a jewelry case with a beautiful pearl necklace inside. And he says, I just found this in the men's room. Why, this is really nice. What do you think we should do? I'm 18. I don't know anything. Why are you asking me? So well, I put it in lost and found. He said, yeah, but you know, this is expensive. Like, if you put this in lost and found, someone's just going to grab it. So as we're kind of thinking about what to do with this nice piece of jewelry, I get a phone call. The guy says, hey, it was in your gas station a while ago, and I can't find this pearl necklace I bought for my wife. I'm like, oh, yeah, this guy found it. It's right here. He's like, oh, you saved my life. This is great. Tell that guy to stay put, and I'll give him $200 reward. Just stay there. Right? So great. I tell the guy, hey, stay for half an hour. Life's good. The guy says, great, except I have a job interview in Goleta in 15 minutes. I can't stay. 
I said, that's fine. I said, leave it with me. I'll keep it 200 bucks. I'll give it to you. He said, you know, you're so nice. Oh, why don't we just split the reward? Oh, well, that seems nice. Sure. He said, so I'll give you the necklace. You give me 100 bucks. And when the guy comes, he'll give you 200. And we meet you. Oh, now you see it, right? I was conned. This is a classic con called the pigeon drop. And I was the pigeon. All right? Now, what happened in this con? It's not that the con man showed he trusted me. Is he got me to trust him. Remember from our research, what happens then is that I release oxytocin. I want to reciprocate. This guy is so nice. He's sharing the money with me. Great guy. Right? Of course, two hours later, I call the phone number. The man on the phone gives me. Everything's gone. All right? And I took the money out of the cash drawer, by the way. So I had to tell my boss, you know, um, I borrowed 100 bucks. Right? So this is going on all the time. Not just con men, but commercials, advertising. The system is being manipulated. Okay? And we found that about 95% of the people in our experiments have an intact oxytocin system. That is, when they're trusted, they release oxytocin, then they reciprocate the money. But 5% don't. And these 5% are dangerous. So they have the attributes of psychopaths. They're deceptive. They don't bond well to people. They don't have a lot of friends. Okay? And for these individuals, uh, you have to worry about them. They never reciprocate money. So they are unconditional non-reciprocators. You send them money, they keep it all. But that's a lot of syllables. What do we really call them in my lab? We call them bastards. <laughs> right? These are not people you want to have a beer with. They're not pleasant. Okay? So uh, it turns out that one of these guys lives not far from here in San Quentin. A, a San Francisco computer programmer, an entrepreneur named Hans Reiser, who in 2008 decided to strangle to death his wife instead of letting her divorce him. He was convicted. He's serving a life sentence at San Quentin. Last year, he wrote a four-page handwritten appeal to the state of California requesting a new trial, claiming that his lawyer had an oxytocin dysfunction and citing my research. Okay. So these psychopaths are identifiable with a blood test. Right? They don't have what we have. And so what we have when we're trusted is the sense of connection. So in a recent experiment, we asked, what does it feel like? What's the subjective experience when your brain is flooded with oxytocin, your own oxytocin? And what we found correlated most with the release of oxytocin was empathy. And so who do we trust? We trust people we can connect to. We trust people that we think we understand. Right? And there's lots of ways you can do this. We found in a variety of experiments. You can do it, for example, through tweeting. So an experiment I designed for Fast Company magazine, I took blood while the reporter tweeted. What we found his oxytocin levels went way up. In fact, they went up as much as a groom at his wedding. Right? So your brain does not differentiate between this person in front of me in the room, who's being nice to me, and someone quite distant. Okay? And we found the role of touch. So we found that touch in experiments not only uh, induces the brain to release oxytocin, but when you're touched and trusted, you're highly reciprocal. You're giving them all kinds of money. Okay, so because I want people to connect to me and trust me, this got me the reputation of Dr. Love. I hug everybody. Okay, so when you come talk to me afterwards, come by, get a hug. <laughs> I want to release oxytocin. I want to connect to people. So we're doing this all the time. So what you take from this is that there are lots of ways to induce people to trust you good ways and bad ways. And the more you do it, the more you release these chemicals are associated with love, with connection, with empathy. And that's really the world that we want to live in, right? I want to live in a world where trust is high, connection is high. I have a rich social network around me. So I encourage you to trust your pilot, the mechanic, even the drivers on the 101, right? Just watch out for the 5%. Thank you very much.